We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. In God's speed, John Glenn. Roger, zero G, and I feel fine. Get my feet up. Okay, I'm out. How does it feel for the United States to be the new record holder? At last, huh? When that baby light, there's no doubt about it. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. Hello and welcome. This is Michael Annis, and you're listening to episode 101 of the Space Rocket History Podcast. And now, Apollo Preliminary Design, Part 2. Recapping from episode 100, President Eisenhower stepped up development of the Super Booster Program, and Von Braun's group completed the first test firing of the Saturn I booster. The Lowe Committee determined that a circumlunar flight was not a high enough goal to receive funding. The goal was therefore changed to a lunar landing. With the election of John F. Kennedy, a new NASA administrator was named. James Webb replaced Thomas Keith Glennon. The Space Task Group requested proposals from 88 bidders for an Apollo feasibility study. Only 14 firms submitted bids. Convair, General Electric, and Martin Company were selected for the feasibility study. Martin produced the best proposal using a five-part spacecraft. The command module was a flat-bottomed cone with a rounded apex and a tower for a tractor rocket launch escape system. Behind the flat aft bulkhead were propulsion, equipment, and mission modules. By the end of April 1961, NASA's three top executives, James Webb, Hugh Dryden, and Robert Siemens, knew that Apollo would soon become an approved project aimed at landing men on the moon. The agency's engineers had done some thinking, but little planning for that particular step which they viewed only as a possible objective for the 1970s. Then, President Kennedy's challenge in late May abruptly made moon landing a goal for the 1960s. Adjustment within NASA to meet the new charge was not an easy task. Transfers from other agencies and a few recently created offices had resulted in a relatively strong and versatile organization. But, in May 1961, NASA was not really prepared to direct an immense Apollo program designed to fly its spacecraft to the moon. New and special facilities would be needed, and the aerospace industry would have to be marshaled to develop vehicles not easily adapted to production lines. But at this point, no one had even decided just what Apollo component parts should be or what they should look like. Despite all the committee and task group work done since NASA opened for business, not one of the vehicles from the ground up was sufficiently defined for an industrial contractor to develop and build. Nevertheless, due to the time limitations imposed by President Kennedy, Administrator Webb asked Associate Administrator Siemens to get the pieces of Apollo that were nearly defined under contract. But there was not even an appropriate project office to implement this order. In order to get things moving, ad hoc committees and task groups would have to do the work. So for the remainder of 1961, until NASA could recruit enough skilled people and organize them to carry out Apollo's mammoth assignment, Siemens would continue to operate in this fashion. To begin upgrading NASA's tentative planning from circumlunar flights to lunar landing missions, Siemens, on May 2, 1961, set up an ad hoc group led by William A. Fleming. The task was reminiscent of that given to George Lowe's committee that we covered last episode, except the Fleming group 
was tasked to place more emphasis on the landing stage than Lowe's group had. This leads us into the beginning discussion of mode. By that, I mean the method that Apollo would use to land on the moon. There were four main choices. The first, direct ascent. The spacecraft would be launched as a unit and travel directly to the moon and land. It would return, leaving its landing stage on the moon. This design would require development of the extremely powerful Nova launch vehicle. The second method, Earth Orbit Rendezvous. Multiple rocket launches, up to 15 in some plans, would carry parts of a direct ascent spacecraft and propulsion units for translunar injection. These would be assembled into a single spacecraft in orbit. The third method, Lunar Orbit Rendezvous. A single Saturn V could launch a spacecraft that was composed of a command spacecraft which would remain in orbit around the moon while a smaller two-stage lander would carry two astronauts to the surface, return to dock with the command ship, and then be discarded. Landing only a small part of the spacecraft on the moon and returning an even smaller part to lunar orbit minimized the total mass to be launched from the Earth. And the fourth method, Lunar Surface Rendezvous. Two spacecraft would be launched in succession. The first, an automated vehicle carrying propellant for the return to Earth, would land on the moon. To be followed, sometime later, by the manned vehicle. Propellant would have to be transferred from the automated vehicle to the manned vehicle. Resolving the mode question was perhaps the most difficult decision of the entire Apollo program. The debate occupied NASA and touched off arguments from other governmental agencies and from industry for about a year and a half. General agreement on this pivotal part of the Apollo mission was essential for the selection and development of both the Saturn V launch vehicle and the lunar module that completed the Apollo hardware stack. Passions among the participants in the mode battle appeared violent and even divisive. But when the decision was finally made, in July of 1962, the centers and headquarters groups closed ranks and proceeded with the plan. Now back to Fleming. Since Siemens had given him so little time to complete his study, Fleming's quickly settled on the direct ascent mode as the way to reach the moon. No rendezvous was required. For the final approach to landing, Fleming's group concluded a stage weighing 43,000 kilograms would be needed, with 85% of that being the fuel load. Once Fleming had selected the direct ascent mode, Siemens realized that he needed more options, so he formed a second committee headed by Bruce London from the Lewis Research Center to study the choices. The eight-man committee concentrated on the rendezvous methods, mostly Earth orbit rendezvous in which two or more vehicles would link up in low Earth orbit and journey to the moon as a unit. But... They also considered lunar orbit rendezvous, which required a single vehicle to fly to the moon, orbit that body while one of its sections landed on the surface and returned to the orbiting vehicle, and then returned to the Earth. Little or no consideration was given to the lunar surface rendezvous method. London's group believed that rendezvous offered two attractions. First, Deciding on the launch vehicle size. Nova or several proposed versions of an advanced Saturn would not restrict future growth. And the second attraction, rendezvous would permit lunar landings to be made with smaller boosters using rocket engines already under development. The London team favored Earth orbit rendezvous with two or three of the advanced Saturns. They considered it safer 
Although they conceded that lunar orbit rendezvous would require less propellant and, in theory, could be done with a single Saturn C3, one of the versions under consideration. NASA officials gathered in June 1961 to hear what both Fleming and London had to report. Although the audience asked a few questions after each presentation, it was obvious that neither committee had made real progress. They did root out some difficulties that lay ahead and present some suggestions on how a lunar landing might be made, but actually little could be done at the time, and they knew it, since NASA did not know how much money Congress intended to appropriate. This sudden preoccupation in NASA's highest echelons with the mode of flying to the moon put the spacecraft development planners in a quandary. Space task group engineers had the contractors' feasibility study reports in hand and had used them and their own studies in drafting specifications for a spacecraft hardware contract. The major question was whether they would have to wait until all the pieces in the Apollo stack were defined before awarding the contract. Robert Gilruth went to Washington on June 2nd to find out. During a meeting with Abe Silverstein and his spaceflight program staff, a consensus developed on the six areas in which major contracts would be needed. 1. Launch Vehicles 2. The Spacecraft Command Module, which would double as the return vehicle. 3. The Propulsion Module, with extra duty as the Lunar Takeoff Section. 4. The Lunar Landing Stage, which would be both a braking rocket and a lunar launch pad. 5. The Communications and Tracking Network. and 6. The Earth Launch Facilities. In order to get these projects underway, Gilruth was given approval to release the spacecraft development contract. Gilruth took this good news back to Virginia, but there was a problem. What exactly would industry be bidding on? The unquestionable favorite for the space task group was a modified Mercury capsule, which was a bell shape extended into a conical pyramid. Its chief competitor was a lifting body design with trims and flaps, championed by Alfred Eggers and his colleagues at the Ames Research Center. Max Faget, leading spacecraft designer at Space Task Group, later said that one of his major objectives was to make the Apollo command module big enough. At the time, they were just finding out all the problems caused by a too small Mercury capsule. So, Faget set the diameter at the base of the Apollo craft at 4.3 meters, as opposed to Mercury's 1.8 meters. But when Faget asked Werner von Braun at Marshall to fly some models of the craft, there was a problem. Since early Saturn vehicles did not have a payload, Marshall had used spare Jupiter missile nose cones on the first test flights, so Douglas Aircraft Company had resized the Saturn's S-4 stage to fit the Jupiter body, which was smaller than the Apollo command module. Von Braun contended that enlarging the S-4 would cost millions of dollars, and the space task group did not argue the point. But there was a solution. Until this time, the design concept for Apollo heat shield had called for a sharp rim, as in Mercury, which increased the total drag and gave more lifting capability. Rather than decrease the interior volume of Apollo, Faget's design team simply rounded the edge to match the Saturn S-4. The command module's rounded edges simplified another design decision. Faget wanted to use beryllium shingles on the afterbody, as he had in Mercury, to take care of re-entry heating, but Langley engineers believed the spaceship would be traveling too fast for shingles to handle the heat. The design group decided to wrap an ablative heat shield around the whole command module. This wraparound shield had another advantage. 
One of the big questions about outer space was radiation exposure. James Van Allen, who discovered the radiation belt surrounding the Earth, had predicted exposure would be severe. Encapsulating the space vehicle with ablative material as an additional guard against radiation, even though it entailed a large weight penalty, was a big selling point for the heat shield. At this point, the space task group engineers were satisfied with their design, although they were not too sure that anyone else in NASA liked it. George Lowe found merit in both the blunt and lifting body configurations and suggested to Silverstein that two prime spacecraft contractors be hired, each to work from a different set of specifications. However, the space task group engineers wanted absolutely no part of this dual approach with blunt versus lifting body. In early July, Caldwell Johnson was elected to talk to Gilruth to explain their reasons for insisting on the blunt body shape. Johnson emphasized mainly the operational advantages and the experience gained from Mercury that would accrue to Apollo. Gilruth relented and the Apollo planners pressed on, drawing up a hardware development contract for their chosen craft. They decided to worry about adapting the vehicle for lunar landing later. Jack Heberlig, a member of Faget's design team for the Mercury capsule, drafted the hardware guidelines for the Apollo command module. During this time, Robert Pyland and John Dishner set up a technical conference to apprise potential contractors of NASA's requirements. Invitations were sent to 1,200 representatives from industry and 160 from government agencies. From July 18th through the 20th, 1961, more than 1,000 people representing 300 companies, the White House staff, Congress, and other governmental departments attended a NASA Industry Apollo Technical Conference in Washington. The first day, NASA engineers talked about space vehicle design, mission profiles, and navigation, guidance, and control. And the second day, the attendees heard papers on space environment, entry heating, and thermal protection, and onboard systems. During these sessions, the space task group speakers pushed their blunt body shape. Gilruth's people never doubted that the keystone to Apollo was the spacecraft itself. As they waited for higher authority to act, they continued to plan with Marshall a series of tests using a blunt body capsule. By the end of July, Administrator Webb had approved the procurement plan and Glenn Bailey, Gilruth's contracting officer, had mailed out the request for proposals. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about astro-navigation. The guidance and navigation system was a central concern in spacecraft design. To get to the moon and back to Earth was a monumental task. NASA had little experience in this field, but neither did anyone else. In fact, when NASA began in 1958, more work had been done in celestial mechanics for trips to Mars than to the Moon. The Air Force had contracted with MIT to provide research on interplanetary guidance and navigation systems. Out of this came a relatively extensive study for an unmanned probe to pass by and photograph Mars. By the time the research was finished, however, the space exploration belonged exclusively to NASA. With the blessings of the Air Force, MIT engineers took the results of their study to NASA headquarters on September 1959. However, their timing was bad. Only two days earlier, the Russians had crash-landed Lunik 2 on the moon, the first man-made object to reach that body. And they had impressed the American space community by having built a launch vehicle powerful enough and a guidance system sophisticated enough 
to get it there. In this atmosphere, the MIT presentation achieved only a small study contract, and when feasibility contracts for the Apollo spacecraft were awarded in November 1960, how to get the crew to the moon and back was still a question. Like other phases of Apollo, the guidance and navigation system drew on the past. The foundation had been laid by Kepler, Newton, and Laplace in theoretical celestial mechanics and had been advanced as a practical science for such devices as Foucault's gyroscope. However, these and other achievements in aerial navigation and space guidance and control were not sufficient for a trip to the moon. To a great extent, lunar navigation development relied on such newcomers in the field as computers and worldwide tracking and communications networks. By the 1960s, the electronic computer had become an integral tool of science, technology, and business. Without its capabilities for memorizing, calculating, comparing and displaying astronomical amounts of data, the lunar landing program would have been impossible. Worldwide tracking and communications network evolved out of meteorology, astronomy, telemetry, missile re, and automatic spacecraft experience into manned space flight planning and operations. Most of the credit for telecommunications work at NASA operations belongs to Goddard Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Myriads of data collected from unmanned satellites were processed daily in its computer banks and transmitted to such agencies as the Weather Bureau and the Geological Survey. Guidance and control technology shared the same evolutionary roots as tracking and communications but it also drew on advances in avionics, gyroscopics, maritime and aerial navigation, anti-submarine and anti-aircraft fire control systems, and cybernetics. MIT was the obvious place for NASA to look for help in Apollo's astro-navigation problems. For many years, Charles Stark Draper, director of MIT's Instrumentation Laboratory, had been recognized as the man most directly responsible for the application of automatic pilots and inertial guidance systems. And achievements in such second-generation intercontinental ballistic missiles as the Polaris made Draper's laboratory the logical sole source choice for the Apollo system. Draper appointed Milton B. Tregesser as project manager and David G. Hug as technical director. These new Apollo leaders consulted with guidance theoreticians at Ames Research Center before starting on the contract. Reassured by these talks and by the in-house MIT work of J. H. Lanning in 1958 on preliminary designs for a Mars mission, and of J. S. Miller and Richard H. Batten in 1960 on studies of applied mathematics, Draper's laboratory was convinced that it had no near rivals in the field. In August 1961, the MIT Instrumentation Laboratory signed a contract with NASA for the Apollo Guidance and Control System. This was NASA's first contract for Apollo. From the beginning, there was clear understanding that MIT would do only the technical design and prototype development. When the manufacturing phase commenced, industrial contractors would take over. NASA monitors anticipated some problems in employing separate firms to make the guidance, control, and navigation equipment. But that could wait. In the meantime, Draper's men were not completely sure that NASA people really understood the difference between the guidance, control, and navigation. Guidance to MIT meant directing the movements of the craft with particular reference to a selected path or trajectory. 
navigation in space as it is on the seas referred to determining present position as accurately as possible in relation to a future destination. Control, specifically in astronautics, was the directing of a craft's movements with relation to its attitude, pitch, yaw, or roll, or velocity, speed and direction, a vector quality. MIT's experience centered on guidance and navigation. NASA engineers, particularly those who had worked with Earth orbital flight, emphasized the guidance and control. Still, NASA Apollo engineers were encouraged by what they saw of the laboratory's work and were assured by MIT that getting to the moon and back was simpler than getting an anti-ballistic missile or circumnavigating the Earth underwater in a nuclear submarine. But NASA officials had some doubts. In June 1961, Dryden requested MIT's Draper to come to Washington to discuss guidance and navigation problems with Administrator Webb. Webb asked if MIT could really get to the moon and back safely. Draper replied that he would be willing to make the voyage himself if Webb would guarantee the propulsion system. Over the next few months, Draper continued to hear mutterings of disbelief from NASA. So, he decided to display his confidence in his team by writing Siemens a letter. Here is an excerpt. I, meaning Draper, would like to volunteer for service as a crew member on the Apollo mission to the moon. We at the MIT Instrument Laboratory are going full throttle on the Apollo guidance work, and I am sure that our endeavors will lead to success. Let me know what application blanks I should fill out. <laughs> Draper's offer to serve as an astronaut caused a ripple of laughter throughout NASA headquarters, but only for a moment. There were other problems to resolve. The basic rocket booster for the moon mission was still in question, and NASA administrators were in the process of selecting a spacecraft manufacturer. Thanks for listening to this archive episode of the Space Rocket History Podcast. If you are financially able, please support the podcast by going to the homepage spacerockethistory.com and clicking on the orange donate button or the Patreon link. Thanks.